All praise to the Most High, Yahweh Elyun, Lord of eternal creation, God of my vindication, Lord who hear of supplication. Amen. I want to give honor to my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, Yahshua HaMashiach, the very word of God, the wonderful counselor. We're coming out of the Ephesians. We're dealing with the whole armor of God. The whole armor of God. Ephesians chapter 6. Follow me in the scripture. Verse 10 we're starting at. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. And in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual Wickedness in high places. Have you seen it? For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world. Several activities. Principalities is dealing with the activities of demons. And the Bible may involve Many demons, sometimes they cause physical disease or mental suffering. We're dealing with verse 12 right now. This is dealing with the activities of demons. You understand? Sometimes they cause physical disease or mental suffering. However, not all mental disorders are demonic in origin. Demons also tempt people into immoral practices. They originate and propagate false doctrines taught by heretical religious groups. As you see in 1 Timothy 4.1. Let's turn to that. First Timothy 4 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressively that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. You see this? Demons are real. Incorporeal beings, fallen angels who rebelled against God in heaven and were cast out of his presence. Thus, much of what is true of angels is also true of demons. They, however, appear to be evil in nature and loyal to Satan, underestimating their immense power would be a grave mistake. Christians who believe they can wrestle with demons without using the whole armor of God are seriously deluded. While apparently some demons are currently confined, as you read in 2 Peter 2, 4 and Jude 6. Most are not and will not be finally punished until the millennium. Revelations 20 verse 3. After a brief period of freedom at the end of the millennium during which they inspire a final rebellion. They will be eternally confined to hell which was originally Prepared for them. 
Matthew 25, 41. Second Peter 2, 4. Let's go to Second Peter. Second Peter 2, 4. Follow me in the scripture. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 4. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Have you seen it? Amen. So these angels that are fallen, that have sinned, have been cast down to hell and are in chains of darkness to be reserved until judgment day. Amen. The prince of this world has already been judged. Verse 6 of Jude. And the angels which kept not their first estate. But left their habitation. He hath reserved an everlasting chains under darkness. Unto the judgment of the great day. Amen. Jude here. You see, he is uh, in accordance with what the Apostle Peter has spoken about that we just read about. In second Peter two, four, the non conical book of Enoch, chapter six through ten may also be quoted here or an oral tradition that is also in that book. His apparent use of non-canonical writings does not mean he considered them to be on the same level as scripture itself. You see, Paul's reference to secular writers in order to make a point in Acts 17, 28 and 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Also, Titus 1.12. Amen. Let's, let's go to Titus 1.12. Swiftly and quickly. I want to break this down like an organic compound. I'm breaking. Split, we splitting atoms right here. You understand? Into biaps. We split atoms into corks and we split corks into biaps and we split biaps into zetties. We split in atoms. Titus 112. This is dealing with warnings against false teachers. Let's start at verse 10. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision whose mouths must be stopped who subvert whole houses have you seen it whose mouths whose mouths must be stopped who subvert whole houses i have family members like this whose mouths must be stopped who subvert Whole houses, home wreckers, teaching things which they ought not, or filthy lucre, lucre's sake. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, The Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith. The scripture says, rebuke them sharply, 
that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Unto, verse 15, unto the pure, all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works, they deny him being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. Have you seen it? The circumcision Paul describes the Jews who are trying to impose the teachings of Moses, especially circumcision as necessary for salvation. You see? On the Christians of Crete as being unruly, not subject to rule or order. He also calls them deceivers. A prophet of their own refers to the Cretan poet Epimendes, Epimendes, Epimenides, who was born in 600 BC, whom Paul quotes merely to prove a point. Paul instructs Titus to perform a task of reproof. He is to rebuke them sharply. Jewish fables refer to the Jewish myth that is legalistic error, as you see in 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 5. Amen. And let's uh, jump back into uh, the armor of God where we're at in Ephesians chapter 6. We're in verse uh, 12. You see. The Bible also teaches that some people were taught by false prophets. Some people were possessed by demons, as you read in the Gospel of Mark chapter 1, verse 23. Although demons are committed to do evil, God will use them to accomplish his plan during the end of the age. Revelation 16, 14. Let's go to that. Revelation 16, 14. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. You see, let's go back to verse 13, Revelation 16, 13. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. You see, three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. You see, the three unclean spirits are demons who support the activities of Satan. The beast and the false prophet by means of miracles, they will convince the eastern kings and all the armies of the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather in Palestine to fight against the second coming of Christ. Revelations 19, 19. This is Satan's final attempt to prevent Christ's return. Verse 15. Behold, I come as a thief. This is Christ speaking. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Verse 15 is an extortion, excuse me, is an exhortation to the surviving believers to be watchful and alert. Matthew 24, 32 and 25, 13. And to remain faithful and loyal to Christ during a time of intense persecution. To have garments rather than be naked relates to the spiritual preparedness. 
Verse 16. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. You see? The final battle as Armageddon from the Hebrew Har. H-A-R. Megeddon. har Megeddon. You see? The hill of Megiddo. The hill country of Megiddo. In the adjacent valley of Estralon have been the site of many important battles, as you see in Judges 5.19 and 2 Kings 9, 27, 23, and 29. Have you seen it? Verse 17. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air. And there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, it is done. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings. And there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth. So mighty an earthquake and so great. Mm, 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 mm. Verse 19. And the great city was divided into three parts. And the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of her wrath of his wrath. Let me read that again. And the great city was divided into three parts. And the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon, America, came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. As Babylon, America was built off the backs of Africans, of those who they kidnapped and enslaved. America was built off slavery. This great nation, Babylon, sucking the blood of the sufferers as the great late Bob Marley saying about verse 20 and every island fled away and the mountains were not found and there fell upon men a great hell hail like rocks of snow ice balls and there fell upon men a great hell out of heaven every stone about the weight of a talent and men blaspheme God because of the plague of hell. For the plague thereof was exceeding great. Mm -mm -mm. My God. Lord have mercy. The seventh vial produces the destruction of Babylon, America. The great city, Babylon, is further described and identified in chapter 17, 18. The statement is done shows that with this vial in the return of Christ himself, the judgments are now finished. A tremendous earthquake destroys the great city and the cities of the nations. The cup symbolizes the wrath of God. The large hell, a talent weighs about 60 to 100 pounds of ice balls will fall from the sky may help to destroy the cities as you've seen in Joshua 10 11 and Ezekiel 38 18 through 22 but unbelieving mankind still blasphemes God and has no opportunity for repentance the seventh vow Vial is the last of the seven plagues and also completes both the seventh trumpet and the seventh seal that's talked about in Revelation 8 1. The doom of Babylon is predicted in chapter 17. You see, and there came one of the seven angels. 17 one of revelations and there came one of the seven angels which had seven vials and talked with me saying unto me come hither 
I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. As you see the Statue of Liberty, the Statue of Liberty sits on the waters in New York, the New York, you see, having a crown upon its head of 13 horns, a crown of 13 horns. This statue was a gift from France to New York after the abolishment of slavery in 1865. It represents the great whore or the great harlot of America, the great whore of Babylon. Verse seven, verse one of chapter 17. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me. Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the king of the earth hath committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. You see? Look at all the things that Babylon, America has done. In America, two men and two women can get married to each other. Two men can get married to each other because President Obama passed this bill for same-sex marriage. This is something that was done by President Abominable, President Abomination, President Obama. He did more for the homosexual community than he has done for his own race of people in which he is a member of. Of. That's why devils have no discrimination against race, color, or creed. You have black devils, white devils, Indian devils, Asian devils. Verse 3, chapter 17, Revelation. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy having seven heads and ten horns you see that the seven heads are the are the allies the ten horns go around the statue of liberty the crown that is on the Statue of Liberty has ten horns on the crown. The seven heads are the seven allies of Babylon. You have the United Kingdom. You have Russia. You have China. You have Italy, which is the seat of Rome, where the Pope is, and so forth and so on. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abomination and filthiness of her fornication. As you've seen, the Queen of England had this had decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. Have you seen it? Chapter 17 and 18 picture the judgment of God on a system, empire, and city called Babylon the Great. It is a more detailed description of the seventh vow. The great whore is named Babylon the Great. Chapter 17 and 18 show her judgment. The waters represent the various peoples and nations of earth. She sitteth upon them in the sense that she has worldwide influence, her harlotry and fornication refers either to physical immortality and morality, excuse me, or more likely spiritual adultery, idolatry and religious apostasy. As you see in Isaiah chapter 121, 23, 16 and 17, Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 20 to 37 Chapter 13, 27, Ezekiel 16, 15 through 43, Hosea 2, 5, and Nahum 3, 4. 
The kings and inhabitants of the earth have opened their arms to her influence. The beast is the first beast of chapter 13, the Antichrist and his empire. Her sitting upon the beast represents the intimate association between the Antichrist and the harlot and association of support, influence or control. You see? Verse 5. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abomination of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. The elegant clothing and jewelry of the woman show her wealth and attractiveness, such as the queen who just passed away, Queen Elizabeth, who just passed away, the, the second. But her activities are filthy and abominable to God. Her mystery name is Babylon the Great. Ancient Babylon is a type of prefigurement of this future Babylon, the United Kingdom, the United States. The harlot will do what literally, literal Babylon did in the past. Oppress God's people and propagate a false religious system. Much of the world's idolatry can be traced back to the historical Babylon in Genesis 11, chapter, chapter 11, 1 through 9. Including the mother child cult of Semiramis, Tammuz. As you see Israelite women weeping for Tammuz in Ezekiel 8.14, which entered other cultures as Ashtoreth, Baal, and Aphrodite, and Venus Cupid, and even Madonna Child as the Black Madonna. As you see, they worship this Black Madonna, the Pope. They secretly uh, worship the Black Madonna, which symbolizes the Virgin Mary and the Christ Child, the Holy Child. As they know that the true Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, was black, African black. You see, the harlot has killed many of God's saints and Christian martyrs throughout the ages and will do so again during the tribulation period. Let's uh, turn to Revelations chapter one. I want to show you something real fast. This is, the, this is a description of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to start at verse 12. And I turn to see the voice. Let's start at verse 11. Let's start at verse 10, excuse me. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice. As of a trumpet. Saying. I am Alpha and Omega. The first and the last. And what thou seest. Write in a book. And send it unto the seven churches. Which are in Asia. Unto Ephesus. And unto Smyrna. And unto Pergamos. And unto. Thyatira. Uh, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. Verse 12. And I turn to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. Verse 13. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man. This is Jesus Christ clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. He had a golden girdle around his waistline with a white garment clothed down to his foot. Verse 14, his head and his hairs were white like wool. This is. 
The prophet John seeing Jesus Christ in a vision, the Lord Jesus Christ in a vision. And he's seeing him at an older age as John was, was in the older age, in his older age when he received this revelation. And he saw Jesus Christ as an older, as an elder, as an elder man, as an elder. Amen. So that's why his hair was white, because he's seeing the Lord as an elder. And it says like wool, because his hair was like lamb's wool, woolly, thick, nappy, strong. You see, like Africans here, his head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow. And his eyes were as a flame of fire. The white in his hair symbolizes him as an elder in his purity. Amen. The wool shows which race he comes out of. The black race. Because only the African black people have hair like wool. Indians don't have hair like wool. Nor do Asians. Nor do Caucasians. Caucasus Asians. Neither one of them have hair like wool. Their hair is like fur. But the African black man, his hair is like wool. Amen. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow. And his eyes were as a flame of fire. Many Africans who have high concentration vibrations of melatonin in their flesh have naturally red eyes. The white part in their eyes are naturally red. So this is another characteristic and description of the Lord Jesus Christ showing that he was indeed an African, an African Jew. Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ was an African Jew. You hear me? Of the tribe of Yehuda, because there's no J's in Hebrew. But in English, we, say, we call him Jesus. In Hebrew, he was called Yahshua. Yahshua. Yahshua HaMashiach. Jesus the Christ, the anointed. As he is the anointed Messiah prophesied to come, even in the Old Testament. That's why he said Moses wrote about me. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow. And his eyes were as a flame of fire. Verse 15. And his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace. And his voice as the sound of many waters. This is more description and characteristic of that of Africans. His feet was like it was burned into a furnace. That means his feet was blackened. A anytime you burn something, it turns black. If you burn trash, the aftermath is black. Whatever you burn over here in Africa, in Ghana, many people, they burn their trash. And when you see the aftermath of the result of that which was burned is black. If you see a house that was on fire, the aftermath of it is blackened. Anytime something is burned, set on fire, it is blackened, the aftermath. Amen? We are carbon-based life forms. Carbon is black. And his feet like unto fine brass. Fine brass is 50% copper and 50% zinc. Now, once you take copper and zinc, which is fine brass, take that and then put it in a furnace and burn it. And now it's blackened. So this is the description of his feet. This is the description of the Lord Jesus Christ. His feet, which is the same color as the rest of his body. Your feet is the same color as your face from head to toe, from the crown of your head to the sole of your feet. He was blackened. His flesh, his skin was blackened. He was a melanated being. He was not a description of what you see around the world when they give life to the image of the beast and they show the Lord Jesus Christ as a white man. 
They show the Lord and Savior, Messiah, Yahshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. They show him as a white man on many stickers on these trotros and these taxis throughout Ghana. They show him as a white man. When the Bible, the Holy Scripture describes him, when John saw him, John saw him as an African, as a Negroid, as it describes Simon in Acts 13, 1. Simon Peter, the nigger, as it says in the scripture. So it describes the Lord Jesus Christ as a, as a, as a Negro, as a black man, as an African. He had hair like lamb's wool, as you see in verse 14. He had eyes like flames of fire, which is the white part, which is naturally red from high vibrations of melatonin. Amen. And then you see his feet was like fine brass burnt into a furnace. He was indeed a black man, a Negro, a Negroid. The Lord Jesus Christ was an African Jew. I'll say it again. That's why it says in the scripture, I know the blaspheme of those who who call themselves Jews and are not. And now the brother Ye uh, is catching uh, so much flack, like Roberta, he's catching flack, you know what I'm saying, for his uh, 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 statements about the, the so-called Jews. Those who call themselves Jews and are not. We know that the tribe of Judah was black. They were African black. When I say black, I'm talking about African black. Not Libyan black. You see, as you see, the Libyans, they don't they don't look like West Africans. They don't look like Ghan Ghanaians. They don't look like Nigerians. They don't look like though the people of Togo or the people of Benin. You see, because it has been whitewashed Egypt and and, 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 and Libya and Tunisia and, and Morocco. All these African countries have been whitewashed. They don't they don't have the black skin no more. You see. But it describes Jesus, his feet was like fine brass burnt into a furnace and his voice as the sound of many waters. That's a raspy voice. That's another characteristic of that of a black man, that of an African. Many Africans have raspy voices. Look at look at a rapper Jadakiss, a black man. Look at how his voice is raspy. He has, he has a raspy voice. That's a description that's a characteristic of that of Africans, African-Americans, you see, which was a term that was first uh, uh, used in 1782 in a Philadelphia, Pennsylvania article, African-American. They like to call us black Americans, but we are African-Americans, you see, they, they call us black Americans to sever our our. Uh, African, our Afro, our Afrocentric, our Afrocentricism. They try to cut off our Africanness, you see. But we are African Americans, you see. We are the we are the African Jews that was talked about in Genesis chapter 15, verse 13, where it says that Abraham's descendants will be in bondage for 400 years in a strange land. That 400 years was from 1619 to 2019 made 400 years of slavery in America. The strange land is Babylon, which is America, sucking the blood of the sufferers, as Bob Marley sang about. So we're dealing with the whole armor of God, putting on the whole armor of God. Demons are also subject, excuse me, objects of worship in various occult practices forbidden by God. Even in the hip hop world in America, Babylon, you see the occult practices. You see, they have all these occult practices. That's why these rappers, they keep dying in Los Angeles, fallen angels. The city of fallen angels. You see? Many rappers have died. Those who have broken the oath. That's why you have to be covered by the blood of the lamb. The blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
for he shed his blood on Calvary. This is your protection, the blood of the lamb. Amen. Your protection is your obedience to God for obedience is better than sacrifice. This is what the prophet Samuel said to King Saul. You see. When you are obedient, you don't have to sacrifice. Amen. Amen. These include divination, which is an illegitimate means of determining the will of God. Necromancy. You know what that is? Necromancy. Copulation with dead bodies and the likes thereof. Calling up dead spirits. Communicating with dead spirits. Efforts to communicate with and interrogate the dead. As you see Saul did. When he interrogated the dead prophet Samuel. Magic. Using formulas and incantations. Sorcery. Perhaps non-medical use of drugs. As you see, recreational marijuana is legal in some of the states of America. They got everybody smoking marijuana, which destroys your brain cells. And it also cuts you off from your visions that God gives you in dreams. Witchcraft and astrology. Which you read about in Deuteronomy chapter 18. Verses 10 through 12. When the Ephesian Christians who were dabbling in the occult repented, there was a great revival in that place. No Christian can ever justify his participation in demonic activities. Exodus 7, 11. Ephesians 6, 12 is what we're dealing with. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. Against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's, I have a song on uh, volume 10 of the Ink Pen Guardian series. Ink Pen Guardian volume 10 Subtitle is Kingdom Come. Ink Pen Guardian Volume 10, Kingdom Come. And all the music that is on that album was delivered to me by the Holy Spirit, by the Holy Ghost. Amen. By the grace of God, he put those songs in my heart and I recorded them. And one of the songs on there is called Principalities. Amen. And I'm speaking about this very verse, Ephesians 6.12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against prince apologies, demons, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Finally, in verse 10, may be rendered from now on or henceforth. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. This spiritual battle Christians are engaged in exist from now on until the Lord's return. Look at what's happening with the brother Ye. He's trying to con Ye here in the West, America, Babylon. Kanye West. America is called the West. They're trying to con Ye in the West. And he's speaking out against it. There is no quarter given. No ceasefire. No temporary truce. No, ces no cessation of hostilities. From now on till the end, there is all out war you see everywhere there's war as 
Bob Marley spoke about, sang about. The remainder of the verse may be paraphrased. Let yourselves constantly be strengthened by the Lord, more precisely, by his mighty power. Verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that Ye, you see, Ye, he, Kanye changed his name to Ye, Ye, Y-E, that Ye, Ye, Ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Put on, put on, put on denotes a sense of urgency demanding immediate action to stand has military overtones this verb was used in classical greek meaning to resist the enemy and hold a critical position in battle the wiles of the devil or the devil's strategy satan carefully devises schemes and tactics against believers Amen. Verse 12. Let's read that again. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, demons, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wrestle. Used of hand to hand combat. This emphasizes the personal and individual nature of spiritual warfare against waged against each local church and Christian. There's spiritual warfare. You see the brother uh, Ye, formerly known as Kanye West, the brother Ye. You know, he legally changed his name. He has a school, a, a, a gospel school where they learn the gospel, gospel and technology. And his own children don't even attend the school. So he's fighting. He's a Christian brother that's fighting against the wiles of the devil like many of us. My daughter was put in a school that I don't agree with. And she doesn't even come home every day. And as 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 saints, as as children of the of, 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 of God, we're supposed to monitor our children daily, nightly. They're supposed to be in our bosom. We're supposed to read the scripture to them. And if your child is away at schooling at seven years old, how can you monitor your child? What's going into their mind? This is a sad thing. And I was in total disagreement with what was done by her mother. These things, we must rebuke these things. And we have to be in prayer constantly. That's why we have to pray without ceasing. Flesh and blood refers to humanity. Such is not the church's advisory. Instead, she opposes principalities, rulers, powers, authorities, rulers, world rulers, spiritual wickedness, wicked spiritual beings, that is, fallen angels, demons and lucifer himself there's a show called lucifer where this this man uh he's the devil he he has a, a nightclub in, in in los angeles los angeles los angels fallen angels you see how it all connects verse 13 ephesians chapter 6 wherefore take unto you the whole armor of god that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Wherefore means because of this, that is because we face such a formidable, a formidable foe. We must avail ourselves of God's provision. Lest the enemy destroy our Christian witness and ministry. Amen. The evil day refers to the periodic demonic onslaughts and satanic assaults. You see, even an argument with your own spouse, you know, it can go from zero to 100. Everything could be peaceful at once. The next thing you know, walk-ins happen. 
and you have satanic onslaughts, assaults, demonic onslaughts and satanic assaults where your, your, your spouse will start, start insulting you. And you're like, where is this coming from? You see, you have to know the scripture. This is spiritual wickedness. This is demonic onslaughts, the evil day, as you see. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye, there go that word ye, ye, and you see Kanye changed his name from Kanye to just ye, that ye may be able to withstand the evil day and having done all to stand. Hallelujah. I'm getting the witness. I'm getting the chill bumps. Amen. The spirit is moving. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. That ye may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. You see, the evil day refers to the periodic demonic onslaughts and satanic assaults. You see, having done all includes both dressing one's self in God's armor and resisting Satan. Having done all these, be ready for the devil will attack again and again. The devil will constantly attack. He will, he will be attacking. So you have to have on the whole armor of God. Amen. You have to put on this armor. It's necessary. It's a necessity. Every day you have to put on this armor. Verse 14. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. You see, we're dealing with the armor of God right now. This is the armor of God. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth. You have to girt your loins with truth. Hallelujah. And having on the breastplate of righteousness, the breastplate of righteousness, you know, having your loins girt with truth, girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Verse 15. And your feet shod, shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace and your feet shod. And your feet shod, barefoot nor shod, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Amen. Verse 16, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation. And the sword of the spirit, which is the, which is the word of God. Amen. As you see in Hebrews 4.12, let's go to Hebrews 4.12 real fast, real quickly and swiftly. I want to spill it on you so you can't wipe it off. For the word of God, Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is quick and powerful, is quick and powerful. And sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. You see, discernment is one of the nine spiritual gifts. Discernment. It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. As soon as I started being attacked by my by, by my by my 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 former my former lover, my loved one, my spouse under Christ under God. She started attacking me with words. It was a verbal onslaught, and my and my, in my mind, my mind was right on Ephesians six twelve. That's why I'm coming out of it right now. Every time something happens, an onslaught, an assault by the devil. Oh, I, I dive right into the scripture. I dive right into the scripture. Amen. Amen and amen and amen. You see, verse 17 of Ephesians chapter 6 correlates with chapter 4 of Hebrews, verse 12. 
Let me read verse 17 and then read of, of, of Ephesians chapter 6 and then reread uh, verse 12 of Hebrews chapter 4. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Verse 12, Hebrews chapter 4. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. You see? Have you seen it? This is the marital part of the man. For the writer here draws an interesting parallel between the joints and the marrow, which have different functions, yet both are part of a human bone structure. Thoughts and intents are also two distinct activities, yet are activities of the mind, both of them. And while the soul and the spirit are distinct in function, both have an immarital character. When considering the nature of humanity, we must realize a person is a two part being that is with body and soul, both in activity or functions of the body. Soul and spirit of a person each has different functions. Have you seen it? See, the apostle St. Paul desired that his converts, whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5.23. Have you seen it? Let's go to that. 1 Thessalonians 5.23. 1 Thessalonians 5.23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. Amen. Amen. This verse does not form a definition of the constituent parts of man. But is a Hebraism to denote the whole man. You see, verse uh, 24, 25, faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. This we're coming out of first Thessalonians chapter five. We in verses 23 to 28. Brethren, pray for us. Greet all brethren with a holy kiss. A holy kiss. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read Unto all the holy brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. You see, the holy kiss was a Jewish custom of welcome. It was also used by the early Christians. This is what we used to do in my church in peaceful holiness. When I was younger, all my aunts, we, I, you know, I always, we all, I always greeted them with the holy kiss. This was, this was how I was raised. This is how we greet each other. I will go give all the women of the church kisses on the cheek. This is how we did. This was the holy kiss. This is how we greeted. This is where you see the Italians. They get this from. You know, they, they, you know, they do the kiss on the cheek. Sometimes you may just touch the cheek with your cheek to cheek. A cheek touch. This is where this is coming from. We're dealing with the whole armor of God. I know we bounced around the scripture. You see, we bounced around the scripture. Amen. Let's jump back into verse. We have verse 18. Let's reread re verse 17 and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit and which and which is the word of God. Verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints and for me that utterance may be given unto me that I may open 
my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Amen. Amen and amen and amen. Now, the whole armor of God consists of six pieces. Amen. As you see, the armor of God is talked about in verses 14 through 17. It consists of six pieces. Number one, truth. Verse 14, stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Truth is a knowledge of the truth of God. The truth of God's word, that is. The ancient soldiers' loins, waist, were girt about with a leather belt which held most of the other pieces of his armor in place. Similarly, the other pieces of the Christian's armor depend on and are held in place by his spiritual belt or his knowledge of the truth of the scripture. Two, the breastplate of righteousness may be read the breastplate which is righteousness it represents a holy character and moral conduct obedience to the truth known produces a godly life righteousness preparation of the gospel of peace as you see in verse 15 and your feet shod with preparation of the gospel of peace means eagerness that comes from the gospel of peace. That is as the Roman soldier wore special shoes called Caligia on his feet, enabling him to advance against his enemy. So the Christian must have on his feet or possess a sense of eagerness or willingness to advantage listen against the devil and take the fight to him you see we're going to take the fight to the devil we we coming to him we bringing this to you we bringing this to your neck we coming at your neck amen such eagerness to contend with satan comes from the gospel of peace this gospel gives peace to the believer freeing him from anxiety through which advantage advances against such a powerful opponent. The shield, which is faith, means taking God at his word by believing his promises. Such trust will protect one from doubts induced by Satan. The helmet, verse five, this, this is number five. Number four was the shield, the shield of faith. Number three is the preparation of the gospel of peace. Number four is the shield of faith. Number five is the helmet of salvation. Since the readers are already Christians, they are here urged to be saved. First Thessalonians 5, 8 describes this helmet as the hope of of salvation that is the certainty assurance of salvation number six is the sword of the spirit which is the word of God the Greek term rendered word is not logos referring to the whole the whole word of God but rima referring to certain portions or selected verses of the scripture. Amen. Praying in verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Praying is grammatically linked 
to stand in verse 14. Without prayer, God's armor is inadequate to achieve victory. Prayer is indispensable, always means on every occasion. That is when Satan attacks in the spirit signifies that with the spirit's help, such prayer for divine aid is to be made. Watching thereunto means being vigilant in this very matter of prayer. They are to pray not just for themselves, but also for all saints. Spiritual combat is both an individual and corporate and corporate matter. In verse 19 and 20. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Paul seeks their prayers in his behalf that he may boldly or plainly make known the gospel and speak it boldly as it ought to be preached. May the Lord have a blessing to the reading and preaching of his word. Our father who art in heaven, holy be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive those who trespass against us as we trespass against them. And do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine the glory, thine the power, thine the honor forever and ever. Amen. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, power, and dominion and majesty both now and forever. As the people of God say, amen and amen and amen. Go with God.